Great, so this is a pretty rare occasion where we've got the, um, uh, a great swathe of, uh, of uh, LGBT partners, Asian LGBT partners here. For the first time on one dais, we've got pretty much a whole massive range from uh, also people that were involved with one of the world's first um, Asian groups, Shakti, which is, uh, started in the 1980s. Um, and uh, I think uh, Paul and me, Ritu and myself were involved. You guys were a bit more involved than I was, but it was a, obviously a great time in terms of, um, it was one of the world's first Asian LGBT groups that went on to form the NAS project, which then on to challenge 377 in, in India. So a massive impact from London. It all started, so our histories are little told, but uh, these are things that are important to remember. This is the 30th anniversary this year of Shakti, so that's a good, uh, good thing to remember again of the histories that, uh, lest we forget, our own histories. Um, so the festival is obviously aimed at um, mental well-being. We're looking at the ideas of um, how LGBT Asian communities can um, explore their well-being, uh, can you know, uh, reinforce their well-being, and uh, individuals can look at how we can build our emotional resilience, build our uh, mental resilience. And I think those films show a range of positive and negative experiences of of the, of the things, the many things that we, as a collective group, fa you know, face in our daily lives. Um, but I thought maybe it's a good idea just to start by introducing the, ask the panel to introduce themselves and just say a few words. Um, Pauline, would you like just to start and say a bit about yourself and your gallery and stuff like that? Um, sorry, it's, it's taken me aback. I just sort of agreed. Um, I'm Pauline Desai. Um, yeah, um, thanks. Um, I've been a race quality officer. Um, and funded um, Shakti when we co-founded it with Shivananda Khan, who unfortunately is no longer with us, um, who died now six years ago, um, very tragically. Um, and we worked, I suppose it was 80, 87, really. I first met him in 86. Um, anyway, that, that from Shakti, which was um, probably about over a 1,000 members in this country during the 80s, it gave rise to um, the first South Asian Turkish Arabic HIV AIDS charity called um, NAS, which then became an international foundation called the NAS Foundation, <coughs> set up an orphanage in India as well, and there were many, many different branches. I mean, it was a time when, in this country, we were living under Margaret Thatcher. Um, we had Section 11. Um, there were all sorts of things that, I mean, we had the race quality law, which was being tested continually to actually see how far um, people could actually take cases. And we did have equalities units in local authorities, and we did have, I suppose, community centres and youth officers, like we do as well. Um, and I think that's something that we don't have today, is sort of an infrastructure. Um, so about um, seven years ago, I set up an alternative. I come out of sort of punk-influenced, second wave of punk, DIY influence and set up a theatre company called Hansel Arts Co-op. We had things like the Dead Jalebis. It was very much in your face, totally alternative, independent. I mean, that sort of blue Mohican used to walk around Southall and stuff. And it was, yeah. And I mean, some of the things are quite interesting to watch some of these films or films that are around. And really, I mean, we were actually living that life and it was pretty... We also were influenced by Dada and Fluxus and all sorts of things, um, but we're predominantly... Asian, Afro-Caribbean, mixed, um, probably about 100 or 120 of us with a fanzine and all sorts of stuff. So it's really nice to see some of that happening today, but the infrastructure isn't there. We were lucky because you could be on the dole. Youth officers, sorry, I'm ranting now. Anyway, um, I run an alternative space called USERP. Um, I think I've given some cards out to people. Please check it out online. Um, and if you fancy coming to Rich Mix tonight, I'm performing live with Modified Sitars um, at midnight for BBC Radio, so come along after. Okay. Anyway, that's me. <laughs> Simon, would you like to just introduce yourself as the filmmaker of one of these wonderful films here? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Seema. Um, my uh, video is Gay Superhero, so probably you can tell which one it was. Um, yeah, so um, I'm... Um, I suppose a moving image artist, but I've also recently founded um, Tomboy. It, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, uh, I'm from Birmingham, and um, so I, I studied fine art here um, in London, and Tomboy really sort of aims to tackle sort of the lack of relevant discourse that's going on, sort of both inside and outside of London. Um, 
we need to sort of, it's about recognising um, that we really, like, whatever's going on is, is great, but it's, what I feel is that it's quite surface level yet and that we really need to delve um, into really tackling um, important sort of what's already there, but also looking at ways that we can um, progress. Um, so, yeah, that's just a baby yet. Um, but, yeah, do have a look at, um, at everything that we, we're going to have going on in the future. It, it very much sort of um, aligns with everything that we're going to be discussing now in terms of mental health <coughs> and what we can do to sort of, um, um, sort of band together as a unit. So yeah, that's me. You've got your films on the web, your website and people can check out your yes. films. And yours. So I have um, my films on my artist website, but um, Tombo is a separate sort of um, its own website and what have you. And, and at the moment we're, we've got sort of articles, um, interviews and what have you, but it, like I said, it's just a baby and it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow yet. So yeah. Thanks. Lex? Thank you. Hello, I'm Lex Mon. I'm co-founder of Gaysians. Um, so in another new group, we launched at Pride this year, London Pride 2017, um, although it's an idea that's been cooking up for a few years now, and actually one of my really good friends, Bobby Tuana, you saw two of his films there, um, Chariot Riders and Little Elephant. This was an idea that we started floating back in 2013, um, to get a group of activists together in the UK to start to mobilise, to start to change the discourse around what was happening with Asian, British Asian, British South Asian LGBTQ. And it was bubbling away, we took a few years to sort of work it out how it was going to work, um, throwing ideas forward and back within a sort of small group. And then Rita Loy, who's sitting over there, another co-founder, I met her earlier this year. We'd actually met a couple of years before at one of Bobby's events at the Alchemy Festival, at one of the LGBT events. And we started to throw ideas around and I guess we had our own alchemy. We came together and thought actually we could join forces and we can be a bit more powerful with this. And you know, the, the Gaysians concept was there, but it was just solidified into coming forward and doing something and it was always about this year to launch at Pride London, iconic event, something that was going to get noticed, especially 2017, like I say, been, this idea has been around for a few years, but it was about this year celebrating the, or you know, honouring the 50th anniversary of partial decriminalisation in this country, 70th year of partition of Mother India, and we as British born South Asians were here saying, you know, we can be here, we can be queer and we're okay, and this is how we live our lives and we're free to, yet if we were born in the motherlands, we'd be criminalised. So it's about um, 2017 being a pivotal year to sort of shift that axis of who we are, what we're doing, and making sure that the voices are heard. So we've come together as a collective, but it's also to delve into the archives of what people are doing, get relevant stuff that's happening now, and also for future generations, so there isn't this repetition of things happening 30 years ago, these waves, and then it's sort of, you know, and new generations come along and they're doing stuff and I'm discovering you know, your work through the, the conversations that I've been having. So it's about changing that axis and making it sure, and also that positivity and celebrating. So it's not just a, you know, we're here, we're queer, we, we love it. So you know, we want to celebrate this stuff. It's, you know, we want to change the narrative. Um, so that's what Gaysians is about. So the website is gaysians.org. Um, it's growing, um, by all means check it out. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Ritu, would you like to just... Uh... I think a lot of people know you already, already, but would you like to just tell us a bit about your uh, great journey so far? I'll so try and keep it yeah. brief, because um, no one else has. <laughs> 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 Especially Polar <laughs> me. Um, so, um, okay, I, I'm one of the founding members of Shakti as well, uh, but we have a difference of opinion about when uh, the organisation started, because I think it was 1988, but... Um, Carrie, Carrie and Polly think it was 1987. So, you can remember anyway. Yes, some time. But it goes to show that we are, we're actually starting to lose um, our memory a little bit about <laughs> when things happened, you know? And, and that goes to show that we perhaps haven't fully documented um, our history, and it's very important that we do do that. Um, Anyway, yes, okay, Shakti, um, I was one of the management committee uh, members, um, it was a great organisation when it was created um, and, uh, you know, the work that was done by some of uh, my colleagues and also people like Shivananda Khan, the, the, the original founder, along with Polomi and so on, just absolutely amazing and as Polomi pointed out, 
it was an organisation that was very, very much needed back then in the 80s. Um, I would argue that we need an organisation like that very much now in the new millennium and it's great to know that Gaysians has set up and, and hopefully might take on that mantle. Um, my history after that, um, primarily I, I have been a DJ since 1986. Um, I first became a uh, resident at the London Lesbian and Gay Centre. Yes, there was a London Lesbian and Gay Centre uh, for about five or six years in Farringdon, in Cowcross Street. Um, and the amazing thing about that particular place, we need one of those again, is that we could socialise there um, not just with drink, not just in a clubbing, club setting, but there was also a ground floor cafe, there was a, a photography dark room, there were meeting rooms. It was a building on five levels, five or six levels, and it was incredible. Um, so anyway, from there uh, I went on to DJ in a lot of other places and we founded Club Carly in uh, 1995, so Carly is now 22 years old. Um, as far as we are able to, we try and keep Carly or make Carly um, a safe and community space um, and, and we are very strict about it being um, uh, a lesbian and gay, to some degree bisexual, certainly uh, queer, uh, uh, supportive of trans people, we've always had chutney queens there, etc, etc. Um, one thing I'm, we're very conscious of with Club Carly is that um, we are not an organisation, we are just a club. However, um, with what we do, um, we're, we're very conscious that there's a really, really massive need for um, more counselling uh, type support for people that come to the club, for people that don't come to the club, uh, for people that are South Asian and, and uh, who are, you know, LGBTQ. It's absolutely vital, and we see this all the time in, in the club. So that's roughly what I do. And I've done. Okay, thank you. Would like just talk. Um, introduce, introduce yourself. Okay. Um, I'm Priyank, and um, I've been a gay rights and LGBT rights activist in India for over nine years. And um, I co-founded a group in 2011 called Queer Campus Bangalore, which acted as a support group for queer identifying youth. And um, we needed a safer space because there were other support groups, but from various age groups. So I think the first meeting that I went to when I was 16 and I walked into this room full of men from ages of 16 to 70 and I said, so the big problem I have is to come out, so how do I do it? And I think I was shut down by saying we've spoken about that enough and it's time to talk about something else. And that's when I said we needed to start something for our own age group, for people within campuses, within workspaces and so on. So that's when we started Queer Campus Bangalore. Um, we also made sure it was a group that you change over time with. So I left in about 2011 or 12. And um, now I founded a group called Queer Collective India that works towards bridging the gap between the society and the queer community in India. As well as work with a group called Queer Arts Movement India that tries to support the arts from the queer community within India take them across the country, perform, and make sure they get paid for it. We also try paying activists for the work they do, because I think they deserve to be paid again. And um, right now I'm working with Queer Asia in London. So, Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's just talk about some of the um, issues we're talking about exploring is mental well-being. Um, Lax, I mean, some of the films obviously reflect on uh, our collective experience, but also mental well-being issues that you many struck. Is there any particular films that really touched you in terms of themes within this the selection of films here? Or? I think there's snippets in a few of them. Um, the one about um, Little Elephant, where there's the, the bit about, you know, taking the, the father taking the daughter to the art galleries and culture and spending time and quality time, and how he valued that time with his daughter, and how his daughter valued the time with her father and those shared memories and she sort of draws on those in moments to to lift her spirits because she hasn't spoken to her father for however many years so there's there's that element of you know good memories and doing things that you like um, that definitely struck me in that film um, I, I guess the seasick one as well because 
again, it's unspoken, but again, it's, it's I guess, it's if you did idea. speak, yeah, it's secret, because it's unspoken, it's unspoken love. But I guess if you flip it, if you were to speak and you were allowed to speak, what that could do for your mental health and well-being, if you could be honest, um, I guess they all have elements. The fish curry, the first one about coming out, um, I guess it's a little bit cryptic. Did the dad go back with a positive experience of his son coming out? Or you, you don't quite know. So um, I think there's elements within all of them. Um, if you look for them, you can find them. Um, but there, again, there are the, sort of, the other sides, the flip sides to it as well, about the violence that's faced and how that can affect your mental health as well. Mm. Seema, your film uh, is both joyous and is the edge of you know, real danger and fear in the films as well. Could you just tell me how you meld it all together and what were the kind of... Why did you mix those different elements and what, what did you want to say, particularly with that particular piece? Um, so... When I save, like, uh, what, like, so when I start making a film, I sort of, I save it, like, basically, I title it based on how I first remember it, when I have to save it for the first time, if that makes any sense. So when I first have to save the file, when I've started working on it, the first thing that clicked in my mind was that, that the aesthetic of that gay superhero. So that, that's how I named it. Um, but in terms of sort of... Um, piecing it together. Um, I, I try to sort of be quite sacrificial with it as much as I can and sort of, sort of incorporate myself and um, incorporate my own experiences um, sort of first hand and, and whatever else, you know. Um, but it is quite in terms of sort of footage or experiences that I capture, they are very disparate. And because of that, um, I mean, I would say that it's pieced together as frivol frivolously as the sort of the separate pieces themselves, that it's all very sort of in flashes. Um, and that's really how I work, sort of um, randomly. Seems like there's also a construction of, perhaps an exploration of construction of identity, but also there's, a fe there's elements of fear of of, of certain dangers in, of, of our society, South Asian societies that also, you know, casteism and et cetera, and, things, and violence against women, et cetera, that have come, have come through the work as well. Definitely, but I, I would say when I was making that, um, it was sort of early this year, um, and during, around the same time I was outed, um, so a lot of it there um, is sort of less sort of touched upon then I would do it now because now sort of my confidence or how my comfort level is has skyrocketed in comparison. Um, but back then that there is an element of, um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I would call it fear, but sort of um, resistance um, or me trying to be as distant as possible, um, like to, to remain sort of within my own constraints of comfort. Um, However, if I made that now, it'd be much different. It'd be even more sort of a little bit more ridiculous and a little bit more um, sort of next level. Um, but I, I, I describe it as, as being sort of there on show as, as opposed to sort of making any particular sort of commentary right now because the fact of the matter is though the issues that are raised in that film, such as caste discrimination, they aren't talked about at all. Um, mm -hmm. So the first step is getting it out there in the first place, you know, um, and then we can sort of start to have debates and, and, and raise criticism about whatever we need to. Um, but yeah, gay superhero it really is a sort of presentation or um, a, a, a notion of awareness. Thank you. Uh, just um, some, obviously in terms of your experience in early days of Shakti as well, um, could you just tell us a bit about your what you think are you some of the unique experiences that maybe, that maybe the LGBT Asian communities face as opposed to other people in terms of mental, the, the challenges of mental well-being, some of the things that we have to overcome. I think it's collectively, I mean, it's a big subject, but I mean, just collectively we uh, have some uh, particular experiences. In a nutshell, look, I, th I think, as I said, I mentioned earlier in my introduction, I think there was a greater infrastructure when I was growing up, let's say, um, and there were Asians and, or what you say, black activists around um, who may not have been that great on 
sexuality and gender, but there, there, were some, there were certain people that you could still go to. I think that's one of the things today which I think is missing in a way. I mean, I work, because I do art projects and political art projects and activist stuff, what comes through is that I work with some very vulnerable young people who come from quite poor backgrounds. Um, that's something we need to talk about in terms of class, where people live, on estates. There's certain estates that I certainly won't work on because it's so racist, places like South Oxy. So I think that's one of the differences as well, just not just within sexuality or being Asian or Afro-Caribbean. Or I think that's, that's really we have to start to examine that and look at what's missing and how we can actually support individuals and communities. Um, and I think in London as well, we have, we have this sense of, oh, it's cosmopolitan and there's so much we can do and there's bars and blah, blah, blah. Um, and there are networks for older people as well. I think some of us also have to get out of our nice, not so nice houses or whatever and start older people who've got more comfortable to actually think about how they can support younger people. I wouldn't say that there's this particular issue, alienation or this or that or, you know, but the stats, the research that we do get out of academia certainly shows that um, whether it's South Asian or Afro-Caribbean youngsters who identify with LGBTQ or exploring certainly face far greater mental health issues in terms of depression, suicide, etc., which are mirrored also with young Asian women. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a multi, multiplicity of things. It's sort of call out to us oldies to get out a bit more and, yeah, as well. Um, but also for younger people to come to people like, you know, us, yep. to actually say, yeah, you've got a space, this is what I'd like to do, and suggest things. Oh, just one more thing. The separation between what goes on in India or wherever, in the, you know, and the diaspora, I think that's really important as well because those films were great but to me a lot of it not all of it but a lot of it besides Zima's film um, a lot of it seemed come, it was a middle class Some of it was sort of a lot the last of film was said in Coventry yeah I think there was yeah there was, <coughs> so, yes. so I think those things with the links with home and whatever and here it's just working those out yeah. Jump to you. So, in terms of the films, we've obviously got a mix of Indian films and British Asian films. I mean, you've, well, you live in both worlds. And what surprises me in India, sometimes it seems more empowered, the LGBT community seem more empowered there than they are here. So, is it something that you've observed, or would you say that agree with that, or in terms of about supporting each other for mental well being and other issues? Or? Well, I mean, most of the films of today, apart from, I think, Sisak and a few, another one, I think were films that were obviously made from a different point of view. But um, also, the one thing that I think really upset me was this, this stereotype of saying, yes, you know, yes, it is criminal to be gay in India or whatever. But we're harping about just that one thing, but there's a lot more things about Section 377. There's the Nalsa judgment that came out in 2015 that, criminal, that gave equal rights to the third gender. We're looking at um, the KPCA, which is the Karnataka Police Act, the Andhra Police Act. States like in the South have police acts that still criminalize the trans community based on a caste identity. So, um, so it's a British law wherein um, it was basically, there was this particular caste, I'm not aware of the name, but this caste who were known to be burglars and um, they would be arrested on site, or that was what the law said. So, I mean, a lot of these uh, laws such as wherein that's used against trans people when trans people are arrested at midnight because they practice sex work, police book them under cases because they claim to be from that caste or so on. And you know, there's a lot of torture. So I mean, we'd hope to see more films like that, firstly. And uh, when it comes to mental well-being, I think um, it's really important for us to look at support groups and the access that we create towards these support groups. Because it's really important to have a support group that's predominantly dominated by an English-speaking middle-class population when we're not looking at creating literature as well as opening groups to people who speak local languages of local cities. Or, and it's a very urban idea to have a support group, firstly. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to create that access and, it's, and we have to look at trying to bridge a way to make sure there is access. So we're looking at creating literature in various languages apart from just 
Hindi or English. We're looking at local languages as well because I think um, most people want to give their parents literature about what it is to be gay and to try translating literature into various languages is the biggest task that we've found. Um, a group in Hyderabad tried translating it but they, had to, they came to a point where they had to figure out what the title or the word gay was in Telugu or what they had to, so it starts from creating a word that's not discriminative as well. Um, do you see, for example, in like if you're in, uh, well, many young people in, in uh, India at the moment because they're challenging, the, they're coming together to challenge um, the establishment as LGBT community. So they seem much more positive about their sexuality in, in, and, and usually compared to UK Asians, for example, you definitely, can argue, uh, as a collective. Definitely, yeah. I think um, over the years we've seen with the large uh, number of prides that happen across the country and I'm India pride happens differently, it happens throughout the year and so on. Um, but I mean, every year you see the number increase and every time that you see the number increase, the lesser people covering their faces and the, the fact that they want to come out and be out there is I think a huge deal. So I think there is progress, but it's going to take a while for the whole progress to happen on a 100% scale. Perhaps. Thank you. Uh, Rita, could you just tell us a bit about how your how Club Kali works around mental health awareness? I know you involve uh, other NHS uh, services in terms of the club, and just tell us a bit about your work and obviously your experience of people that maybe uh, need her some support sometimes, and what and how you've managed to um, help as a as a as a collective as a club. Yeah, um, I don't know how much we really help actually, but are we. <laughs> And what we do, what what we do do is is it's very informal, you know. Um, I mean, this is something I've become much more aware of. I would say in the last three or four years, because now I'm I'm tending not to do the play the main slot at Carly. I'm tending to do the warm up slot, and then that means for the last three hours of the club, I'm out and about um, with the people that come there. Um, and what I find is that. Um, I've got people coming up to me all the time saying, can I just talk to you about the fact that my ex-boyfriend is trying to out me to my parents? Or can I talk to you about the fact that I, you know, about um, my wife at home with, you know, two kids, uh, my two kids, you know, and, but my dad doesn't know and I got married to her and like, I'm trying to get out of the marriage. And, and all of this stuff keeps, seems to come up all the time. And what I find very disappointing is that I can't see what's changed since the 80s. Um, and, and, and when I sort of try and think about where I can refer people to, I don't know where to refer them to. Um, we do have, well, for many years, we had the NAS project um, with a stall always at Club Carly. Um, <coughs> now we sort of, um, we also do um, HIV testing um, at certain times of year as well. That's done through the NAS project and also other uh, support organisations, uh, West London Gay Men's, uh, Blah, something. Like that. I don't know. I don't keep track of all the organisations that come in, but we always try and make sure that there is an organisation of some kind that that is there with leaflets of some kind um, and a friendly face and, and a non-clubbing face and maybe also. Um, you know, other kinds of paraphernalia that might be useful to people that come there. So, as I said, we've, we've always been very clear that Club Carly is not just a club, you know, we, we try and make it much more than that. But I think we, we need a lot more. We need, yeah. we need, our communities need much, many more support services um, and effective ones. And I think um, we also need a lot more individuals who, who are training up to be therapists, counsellors, um, just, uh, yeah, it's very necessary. I mean, I, I would add as well that um, uh, one guy that I know um, who is a, um, a British Asian gay man, um, he has actually now just opened a therapy practice in North Finchley, and I think it's possibly one of the first of its kind. And, and I think, you know, just being able to... Go, I, I know when, when people go for therapy, some people want to go and see somebody who's nothing like them, but other people need to go and see somebody who's just who feel who looks like them, you know. Um, so Pritesh, I'm really I'm really glad he's there. But he's literally opened up in the last three months. It's it's very fresh. 
And um, obviously, services around London are supported by the uh, funded by the NHS. Um, but, um, uh, for example, through the uh, Brixton Real Film Festival, we look at the five ways to well-being, how to cope with. Um, issues around whether they be post-traumatic stress, depression, etc. Many different things that we all we all have good we all have mental health, either good mental health or sometimes bad mental health. But uh, we can uh, we can see we can use the five ways to well-being. You can check that out on the website NHS websites about how you can build your uh, resilience uh, in terms of mental well-being. Um, that something that's useful for everybody. Um, so please do check that out. Um, I think, um, would, you, would the audience like to ask any questions? We've got a little bit of time left before. <coughs> I think we've got a performer coming in. I think they're, they're in, the, in the wings. So I think we've got to do some musical tests quickly before we can give you the final, you know. Actually, Carrie, we you did want to tell you this before, but you're the performer. All oh, right. <laughs> Good job I got my sorry underneath. Anyway, so, any questions from the audience? Anybody like to start? Is it lady just in the middle there? No. That's just there. Um, Is the mic just coming? Yes. Yeah. Hello. Oh. Sorry. Um, well, first and foremost, I just wanted to say thank you for putting on this evening, uh, which has been funny and uh, and moving and very validating. Uh, and I, you know, it's it's possibly one of the first evenings of its kind that I've been able to access, and I've lived in London a few years, um, and that's sort of kind of the point of what I wanted to say. I had the benefit of being in the US for a few months earlier this year, and I was really overwhelmed and inspired by the strength of the activist uh, LGBT uh, South Asian community there, and it really made me feel um, the absence of that kind of solidarity back home in London my experience trying to engage with any kind of support in the years when I really needed it uh, was very poor. Um, and I imagine it would have made a, a world of difference. And it was part of the reason I set up an LGBT youth group, which I've run for the last couple of years, which is not South Asian specific. Uh, but I've had predominantly BME young people come through the door and what it's made me acutely aware of is, while a lot of us might have found healing on the dance floor, um, young people can't access those spaces. They're, they're too young and it's, it's probably not appropriate for them to be there anyway. Some of them manage to access it regardless and that brings a lot of, of dangers for them too. Um, and one thing I've really grappled with is how much visibility really matters and how few of us are in a position to offer that. Um, and the work that is there to be done in schools. Uh, and if you know any of the incredible organizations you're all part of and any of the work you're all doing looked at that, I think it could make the world of difference. And from the you know, 50 or so young people I've worked with, uh, I mean, it, it really would make the world of difference just to see someone like them. Uh, and even for me, you know, a 30-year-old woman, I very clearly remember the first time I met someone who looked like me and was LGBT. And, you know, to be able to give that, to have people like yourselves who are able to sit on a panel, who are able to be visible, um, I think that's very, very special. And I just wanted to, to put that out there and put my, my big wish for stuff happening in schools out there. Thank you. I'll just come back to your, um, so if you look at our website, gaysians.org, it's, it's soft launch, it is out there, but we're going to, the new logo is coming and um, later this year we're going to sort of fully launch it, but there's a partner section on there, and why we founded Gaysians, that's one of the bedrock, you know, core principles of Gaysians was about connecting people and empowering people so that when you've got different people all around the UK, all doing different things as activists and People don't always know what's out there, and you might stumble across it, or it might be word of mouth. And what we want, to, we are creating with Gaysians is, if you were to type in something, and it will bring them all to you in one particular website with different partners, so you can click through, you can see it as a resource, you can come back to it, you can, you know, look at it at your own time. With maybe you're young, but you think actually there is stuff out there. 
and it's got click-throughs to all the different organisations. Queer Asia is on there, Club Carly is on there, NARS Foundation is on there. I'd love for this young youth project that you've got. It may not be South Asian, but it is targeting a need for a younger community. And so we want it to grow, and so then when people look at it, they can click through and think, oh yeah, there is somebody like me, or there is a Muslim LGBT group, or there is a Sikh LGBT group, or there's a Meetup group, or there's a Club Carly, or there's this, there's this, there's that. And it will grow, and then it builds that resource, so we don't have this, that has been mentioned, I think, across the panel, is repetition. Oh, it comes, it dies, services aren't there, buildings aren't available, spaces aren't there, and suddenly a new generation comes and thinks, oh, there's no one like me, there's no other gays out there. So that's what we want to tackle now, I think, as British-based South Asians, as people from diaspora, is to shift that axis. So I'd invite you to look at the website, I'd invite you to send your partner details through so we can have it listed. And so that's, we're targeting that youth angle too, and then you know, it, it will grow, it will build. That's what we're trying to do. You too? Um, yeah, I, I mean, everything you said totally resonated with me. Um, and I think... Uh, it's not just young people, it's, it's people who are middling people, middle-aged people, maybe, middle-aged people, <laughs> it's people older than us. Um, you know, I, I, I really feel like there's nothing for anyone. And, and I think, you know, just watching those, the videos today, um, it was a reminder of that simple nugget uh, that we've all had a problem with, which is loneliness. We think we're alone, we think we're the only one. Um, and that can strike you at any age, uh, whether you're young or, or an old, you know, old gay person, you know, it makes no difference. We really do need more organisations that can bring us together. And this thing of being able to find um, what is out there, what's available, you know, I was at a meeting at City Hall yesterday um, for a, a, an LGBT round table. Um, and um, we talked about the fact that now with the internet, we have so much information out there. You know, you can, you can look on Facebook, you can look on Twitter, you can look on websites and Instagram and so on and so forth. But it's like, you still can't find what you're looking for. Why is that? Why is it? So is what we're looking for not there? Um, because if I, again, if I think back to the 80s, you know, we had, uh, we didn't have the internet, did we? Um, we we had um, you know we had two North newspapers. <laughs> we had two newspapers. There was, it was Capital Gay and the Pink Paper, um, and there was a, a, a gay section in Time Out and a gay section in City Limits magazine. And that's how we got our information. That aside, it was word of mouth. It was flyers in the few venues that we were going to. Now we're in a position whereby 58% of LGBTQ venues have closed down in the last 10 years. So, what do we do? How, how, do, how do we get around this? Well, we've got a young generation here who can <laughs> maybe come up with some answers. Yeah, Seema, yes, perfect. Um, I just want to say that I don't, um, I appreciate what you said. Um, at the same time, there isn't sort of any linear experience or any rigidity to um, coming out or um, identifying if that's the word you want to use or whatever um, and one thing that um, that goes beyond sort of age or um, a coming of age or, or what have you is um, like she said um, having accessibility um, and that goes beyond and that goes sort of for locations as well regions where, wherever you're from um, there's a massive lack of um, support um, it's, it's interesting that you said that there was so much support in, was it America, did you say? Um, and that there was, there's much less here. If you think about how much support there is in London, and think about how, in comparison, everywhere outside of London, there, there is virtually nothing. Um, and I just, I just wanted to reiterate that that's something that Tomboy will really focus on, is, um, is accessibility for all, uh, like in and outside of London as well. Um, one thing that um, I'm looking to, one sort of type of event I'm looking to hold um, are solidarities, and so they're tea parties, um, in a sense, solidarities. Um, and they will be sort of a support group of types um, that will be completely accessible to anyone. And while Tomboy isn't specific to sexuality, that's something that I ident uh, sort of experience firsthand. Um, and that's my sort of everyday. Um, so I really would welcome 
everyone and anyone to sort of get in touch and um, see how we can sort of bring this into fruition. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, great. Let's also just to say that uh, two days ago we had a very brief conversation with somebody from the BFI who said they might like to put on talk, have a chat with you later, <laughs> put some of these films onto the BFI website, BFI Player, possibly to start a maybe a gayish or strand. <laughs> Clear online, and that will be an access for young people, obviously, around the whole of the UK, which might be something quite nice. I'll just say one thing. I mean, there is something that I've been going on and banging on about right across the board is we have a lot of rich British Asians in this country, and I think it's time we start knocking on their doors, you know, whether it's factories or. Yes, yes, yes. And I think, you know, as individuals or as, you know, um, or as groups, I think it's time to actually even have a small network or group or whatever, to actually start asking for this money because it's just certainly not coming from the government until the government changes. And I think it's time to start up in the game because I've noticed like hotels have been doing this big stuff. We're going, oh yeah, we're really like doing queer em employment law and blah, 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 and all sorts of stuff. And having big parties and stuff. But actually see like the group that you've, and by the way, I commend you, it's amazing to have done that. And I, I hope I'm more just people about do. To finish this here, yeah. sorry, yeah, I just want to say that. So, so, so just to uh, say, could you please fill in our question uh, for sorry. the evaluation forms because that helps us get funding for our for next year, hopefully. Uh, that's the film London evaluation forms. But uh, we'd like to move on now.